Hey everybody, what's up? Welcome to the Life Inner Show. We have another awesome episode for you. And the Life Inner Show, in case you didn't know, is all about helping people create lives and businesses that they absolutely love, that jump out of bed excited for. I am joined. I am your well, actually, no, I gotta tell I'm I'm my name is Jason Wojo. I am joined by my co-host, Polish Peter. What's up, PP? Let's admit it, you were gonna say, I'm joined by Jason Vojo for this Jason Vojo show with Jason Vojo, right? <laughs> right. As my yeah, three different personalities. You, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah exactly. Right. Well, hey, dude, come on, you know, I mean, I got, we got to keep it real. So listen, and by man, the way, this is Polish P there, not PP. So, I, okay, yeah, sorry. Don't, don't ever use the PP. He does not like oh. that. Uh, if you meet him in person, so if you meet him in person, definitely do not say that, okay? Don't say PP. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. you, can you repeat that again? Don't say what? <laughs> so listen, um, dude, we got an awesome episode here. Uh, so we have, uh, so we um, we did this life and air live stream event. It was our first ever. It was a uh, it was a it was a digital online version of our of our three day get a life getaway. And this guy's in there. His name is Brad Kuzno, and we start talking. And he is a uh, a former NFL player, but not just that. He has a really really cool story of overcoming adversity, of being an underdog, of being someone that was constantly told they would be worth they were worthless, they'd never amount to anything. And man, I knew we had to get him on the show. Yeah, I'm excited for you guys to listen to this episode because. Um, he shared some of the story on the live stream and it sort of resonated with me because of what he had to go to growing up. As you guys are going to hear it, I mean, his story is a lot more impactful than I think mine ever was. But what I want you guys to listen from the point of view is look at what this he had to go through and what he achieved and what he'd done and how we choose different paths and you know how we can actually have the different choices and be able to create something awesome for ourselves, for our life, you know, as far as life and our vision and all that kind of things. And yeah. I'm just, it's incredible it's, to hear this guy share. Yeah, you, you're, not, you're not limited by your upbringing, by your surroundings. Like those are all incredibly important, but you have a choice. You can do something with it and turn out uh, the way you choose. So let's go right now to that interview with Brad Kuzno. Hey, Brad, what's up? Welcome to the Life in Your Show. Thank you so much for joining us, man. It's great to be here. Thanks this, for inviting me. This is a real pleasure. And, you know, and um, I, I feel really blessed to get to, to have gotten to know you here recently. Um, and I know, I know we haven't been, uh, uh, have, a, have a long history of knowing each other, but um, I just really, really, really knew, that, you know, right off the bat, as soon as I started learning about your story, um, that you had to be a guest on the, on the Life Inner Show podcast. You just have such an awesome story that I know all of our viewers and listeners will resonate with that uh, I just had to get you on, man. Um, and so let's, so for the people who don't know you, just, just uh, you're, you're mostly known for for your nfl career would you say is that is that accurate like that's how people know you oh i think that the average person in the street you know if they would uh, uh particularly in the greater cincinnati area they would remember the name uh brad Cousineau because i was sort of a a legend of being a a walk-on a rudy if you would in college um and cleaning sewers and doing things like that to get to college and then trying out as a walk-on because I needed to find a way to get a scholarship and making the team and eventually went on to become an All-American, played in the NFL for a number of years. And so I've always been an overachiever and, and, uh, and so that would be a, a thing. But, but so but people really know that up, the upbringing oh. of my younger years, that really was what put me onto that path. Well, and that's the kind of the story I wanted to kind of go into way more detail on, on the, uh, on the podcast was like, and so you're known as somebody who has this tremendous story of overcoming adversity of being the underdog. And like, and this is a, this is a huge, this is a huge thing for people because, you know, so many people feel like they've been dealt the wrong hand in life, or they didn't have the upbringing they wanted, or the, you know the chips didn't fall in their direction, or they had they had they had all these you know this adversity in their life. Uh, yet you have an incredible story of just overcoming these things, and it, it it wasn't just one thing; it was several things, one after another after another. And so bring us back, even to to your early childhood, where where your your upbringing uh, was 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 far less than ideal. Like bring us back to that to those days. 
Yeah, I sort of, um, when I look back on it, um, my parents had to get married because of me. Uh, they were 15 years old, probably conceived mm. in the back of a car, um, 1952, 53, that range there. So um, she was, my dad was 16, my mom was 15, um, found out she got pregnant, and uh, then they had a, uh, a shotgun wedding. Um, it was such strife that my dad's parents, my grandparents on his side, wouldn't even come to the wedding. Happened, you know, that fast. And then my mom um, was raised by my grandfather, who was really a hero to me um, at, uh, as I grew up, but he grew up in an orphanage. He lost both of his parents. And something happened when my mom was a, a younger because as she grew up, um, there's things in her life that didn't click. And so here I am, I'm a newborn babe. And from the time of before probably being in the womb, I was not wanted. I, I was all, I was cursed. I was an embarrassment. Every time she'd go out to the store and had me, she'd run into her girlfriends from high school and she had a baby. And um, everybody knew back then it wasn't nearly as accepted as it is today. So I was always shame. I was always an embarrassment. I can never remember being held or cuddled by my parents, ever. Um, and then my mom, my dad was an alcoholic, uh, second, third generation alcoholic. So he worked and drank, worked and drank. He was not a mean drunk, but he just was not there. And whenever he was there, it turned into a major battle because my mom was constantly prodding him. And what my mom would do, I called my dad an alcoholic. My mom was a rageaholic. And, um, and I was her brunt of her rage. And to the point where I, at least five to six times a week, there was a major beating um, that I would receive from that with sweeper cords and belts and whatever. I mean, I just, that just happened all, you know, all the time. And, and to, to bring up my childhood is to think about it this way. I can remember, this would be a, a good way to view it. I'm seven, eight, nine years old. I'm getting ready for school. It's another war, getting ready for school. My mom was pinching me and slapping me, and, and normally she'd be hitting my head against the wall. And one day she slamming my head against the wall. By this time, I stopped crying. I, don't, I didn't cry anymore. And, and she lost it. And she says, it's your fault. It's your fault. If it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be in this predicament. You know, that's that like that. And that's being in a marriage. By this time, she had uh, three, two other boys. And she had three boys. By the time she was 19, she had three boys. Mm -hmm. So here she was, just didn't finish high school. My dad's working all the time or drinking all the time. And, um, and that was my existence. And the thing that separated it, uh, one, my, my grandfather on my mom's side sort of became my hero and took me places and did things like that. And that would be my retreat to get away from mom uh, when things got really bad. And, um, but um, I noticed one thing as I was growing up, I'm just eight, nine, 10 years old. When I, when I was the star of the football game or the, or the, or the baseball game that day, my parents were a little nicer to me that day. I, 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 I couldn't, I wouldn't have been able to say it back then, but there was something mm -hmm. that was running. I didn't get yelled at as much. I didn't get hit at. And so I strove. That's one of the things I did. I wanted to be the best at every sport that I played. And I played hockey, football, uh, baseball, and then in college, uh, high school and college, I also wrestled. So, um, but, but so I always dominated uh, against other peers like that. And I always was an overachiever. I was the smallest guy um, in, the, uh, in college. I played defensive line at middle guard at 195 pounds and made first team All-American. So let's, let's, uh, there's so much there I want to, before we even get even close to okay. that, I want to impact right. so many things here. Did you know when you were growing up that this, was this, did you, did, was this normal to you? Like, did you look around and realize like something's off with my family versus other people's family? Or did you just like, this is, this is just the way it is. Well, and... You know, like a lot of famous like that, it was the hidden secret. Everybody, everybody in our streets fought the Kuzno boys. Cause I mean, I was always working. I was cutting grass. I mean, I did all those, those kinds of things. One to get away from home and right. two, that was money. That was my, my parents, I very seldom bought me clothes. I had to buy my own clothes, things like that. So I knew there was something off, but if that's your only existence, you don't know till you go to somebody else's house and everybody's always on their best behavior when you're visiting someplace. Right. So 
I had no way of really understanding and knowing, but I, ne I never had a friend come over to the house. I never would invite anybody over to our house ever because I never knew what was going to happen. I didn't know if my mom was going to go off on the thing and mm -hmm. whack yeah. me or something like that. So, right. so, um, so no, I, I didn't understand the depravity of the way that I was raised as much as recognizing that I didn't want anybody else to find out about it. So you're, so there you are as a kid and this is, this is, you, you recognize like, Hey, I, I this is kind of, I, I can't let people know about this because I don't know what's going to happen. Like maybe I'm going to get beat worse. Maybe, maybe they're going to not be my friend anymore because they're going to think we're weirdos or, or, or who well, the are fam or the, the family secret. It's like, yeah, you, know, yeah. got sick and, you know, nobody in our sure. street knew that my dad was an alcoholic or that we were having things like that. So, yeah. And then, so, so then all of a sudden you're, you're, you get to this age seven, you think it's seven, eight or nine where you realize you, you and I mean, I'm sure it didn't set in all at for, all at once, but you probably recognize a pattern like, huh, I'm, I'm doing sports here. And the, the days that I do really well, um, there seems to be a little bit more peace, I guess, at home. And so you start to make this connection between your performance and your home life. It didn't really hit me until uh, I was older and maybe even as a parent recognizing of what happens when the parents are sitting around watching their kid's game and somebody has a great hit like that and everyone's high-fiving and they were getting some ego stroking because of uh, what I was doing on the field. And so I think that just sort of, you know, rubbed off. And, and then I picked up on it without realizing it, that I, I liked what happened when I did really well versus when I didn't do well or the rest of the day. You know, I'm wondering also there, and I mean, as a kid, you don't, you don't, can, you can't understand this yet uh, when you're, when you're, when anyone's that age, but there's, there's probably something in there for you too, where you started establishing your worth as being tied to your performance, your value. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. 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 Because I surely didn't have it for uh, unconditional love from my parents or my dad or anything like that. I, I had no self-esteem that way. Yeah. It was done through athletics and, um, and, and, and work. I, I was a very hard worker. I, I did all kinds of job. I was the head janitor except for the boiler room for my grade school, seventh and eighth grade, I was the one that mopped the floors and waxed the floors and did all that stuff. Got paid 50 cents an hour, but it kept me from home. So I yeah. like doing it. Yeah. Exactly. So you, so you're, so you're over, I guess your overachievement kind of, um, personality traits that started to emerge here, um, showed up everywhere. It just wasn't athletics. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, of being responsible of, of recognizing that if I wanted anything nice for clothes, I was going to have to get them myself. Um, you know, I, I, I worked, I worked all kinds of jobs, you know, uh, jobs from, uh, from cutting grass and, and, and snowing, you know, working for a blind guy and helping him out down the street, um, janitor in our grade school. Um, I worked at the cafeteria in my high school to pay for tuition. I had to, you know, do that. I went to a Catholic, Catholic grade school and high school. And so, yeah. um, yeah, so all of that, yeah. And so, you know what I'm also wondering here is, as I'm hearing this, I'm like, you were, and you kind of mentioned it, when you were off working and doing this stuff, you didn't have to be at home. So there's some avoidance behavior built in here too. So you're like, okay, number one, like it's when I do go home, if I if I'm if I've uh, if I've done really well in in sports or whatever, I get it's it's more peaceful. But also, like doing all this stuff keeps me out of the home, so I can avoid that that potential conflict anyway. And so you you really got reinforced from a very young age, like to, to stay busy, to, to achieve things, to do well. Um, and, and so this started for you, um, really showing, showing up for you in, in sports. Right. And so, so you, you, uh, you, had, and you, you kind of, um, mentioned a little bit earlier how, uh, you know, you were for, for some of the positions you played in football, and I want to get into that. Uh, you were kind of undersized and yet you, I guess, I guess you, you, hustled in your athletic endeavors to the extent that you overcame any genetic limitations you may have had to play that out for us. Like when did, when did this really start amping up for you? I mean, because you, I mean, you went on to the NFL, like, so, but clearly th th this pattern has, has followed you for quite some time. So when did you start really, uh, achieving things? Um, when I was when I was probably about eighth grade, seventh or eighth grade, my dad worked in a glass factory, Libby Owens Ford in uh, Toledo, Ohio, and they had a bring your kids to work day, one of those kinds of things. And so, my dad, I really didn't want to go, but he said, "Hey, he was he wanted me to go there and see, you know, what he did and stuff." And 
I went into this glass factory and they got these huge glass furnaces, you know, that's to make glass. And I walked in there and I thought I was walking into hell. It was the most miserable existence I could imagine. And these people worked there. My dad worked there every day. It was about 145 degrees inside because of these big glass furnaces. Mm -hmm. And then they had big barrels of salt tablets back then. That's what they would tell you. And so they'd be eating salt tablets so they wouldn't be sweating and uh, around these glass furnaces. And I was there for about six and a half, seven hours. And I said, if I don't go to school, if I don't go to college, I will probably be working here for the rest of my life. And I was, I mean, that just scared the heck out of me. And um, so I, I, I needed to get a college scholarship. My parents, my, my, my parents never even had a savings account. Uh, every, every, it was, it was eking out an existence. And, and, the, and, and my dad would work two jobs, drink, um, and stuff like that. So we never went hungry, but we never had anything extra you know, and uh, one car. So my mom, when dad would take the car to work, mom had no car, you know, and, and so, so I just really knew that. And then, so through playing football, and I was a good athlete in high school, I, you know, I was all city and all district and baseball and then football and, and like that. But there's thousands of those people all over the country. They don't get scholarships. You know, there's the very rare that get a scholarship. And I got turned down from a lot of schools. Woody Hayes came to visit me from Ohio State, came to visit me when I walked in and, and introduced myself and he goes, son, there must be some mistake. I'm looking for the football player. Now at that time I weighed 185 pounds because I wrestled 185 and I didn't have to cut weight. And so he says, there's no way that you'll ever play division one football and walked out and left. Got turned down from Toledo, Bowling Green, Baldwin Wallace, all kinds of schools I got turned down from. I sat down and started writing letters to college coaches begging for a scholarship. I you know, send a video or a, a film and, and like that. I probably sent 24 letters and that was handwriting each letter. There was no mimeograph machines or like that. Got turned down from all of them or most of them didn't even respond. But one coach from Miami University called me up and said, Brad, uh, are you still interested in coming to Miami? And I said, is there any scholarships? And he goes, no. But we liked what we saw in your film. We think you got some grit to you. Um, but we think we can get you a job uh, in, for the summer, and we can get you into school, but you're going to have to pay for it. Now, this is Miami, Ohio, correct? Miami of Ohio, yes. Okay, yep. Miami University of Ohio, Oxford, Ohio. So I ended up um, – uh, they got me a job. Not Miami didn't get an alumni got me a job, and I worked in a storm sewer, digging out all the crap out of the sewer system around Toledo, the expressway. So when it rains, all that silt and sludge goes someplace. So I'd go down, you know, 20 feet underground and into the big storm sewers, and there would be a 60-inch uh, pipe was a good day. A bad day was a 42-inch pipe because then I was on my hands and knees. And I'd have a big scoop shovel. I'd have a miner's hat on with a thing. I'd be down there cleaning out all the sewers. And that's what I did. For that summer, I got paid $5.50 an hour. And I worked down there with two other guys as we were doing that. And uh, they just mocked me. You know, I was, I was going to college, and these guys were like 35 or 40 years old. And they're going to go, Brad, this is the rest of your life. This is what you're going to be doing for the rest of your life. And I'm sitting there going, no way am I going to do that. So I ended up going to Miami. I paid for my first quarter of school. Didn't know how I was going to pay for my second or third quarter. And I tried out as a walk-on for the, for the freshman team. That was the last year of freshman ineligibility, 1972. And then, so there was a freshman team, and I was uh, the third team linebacker on the freshman squad. And one day, the stud, the stud of that recruiting class was named Tom Thompsy. He was going to be the next All-American guy, and he had a bad day at practice. When, they left for, when we left for lunch, he packed up all of his stuff and quit, gave up a full scholarship. He played middle guard. Middle guards are usually 240, 245, stuff like this. Mm -hmm. And so at practice, they needed – at the scout team, they go, where's Topsy at? And they go, he quit, coach. And they said, well, give me a middle guard here. So I jumped in there. And they said, who's going to get out of here? You're way too small. I mean, 192 pounds at the time. Well, by the time practice, I, I didn't leave. I says, I'm going to, I, I can do this, coach. By the time practice was over, I had made so many tackles that they made the varsity linemen run extra sprints. 
So you can imagine how well liked I was <laughs> mm -hmm. as this rookie you made freshman, look bad. you know, stuff like that. And they were like this, and boy, they just, man, they had it in for me. But mm -hmm. the coaches saw something. They moved me to the middle guard on the freshman team. And by the time that the season, by the time, time the season started, they gave me a third scholarship. And by the time that the year was over, they gave me a full ride. I started, I was the most valuable player on the freshman team. Never missed a game in, in college. Started as a sophomore, which is very unusual. Made all league. Ended up making, I was the most valuable player in the league for two years in a row. Defensive player of the year. All American teams, et cetera, et cetera. Strictly from the perspective of is, that's how I got my ego stroking. As I excelled, I did better and better. And I and, and by that time, by that time, Miami University, we were undefeated for three years. I was one of the major reasons for that because of some of the big plays that I had made. I'm not bragging, I'm just stating a fact. Mm -hmm. I, I had this knack of making big plays, blocking kicks. Uh, my junior year, my junior year, I had 52 sacks. Wow. Most sacks are 10, 11, 12. They double teamed Man. me a lot more in my senior year, and I only had 39 sacks, um, that, which is unheard of. You know, I mean, if, if you get 15 sacks in a year, you're a superstar, you know, at the high school, college, or pro level. I just had that neck. I was very quick and very small, but I was I, I did I, I never missed a game, never got hurt, never had surgery. I, I just had a, a great a great career. Was that was that all? What is it? so? You you clearly were. Um... You had some some of these, so you had this incredible hunger and this drive that had been established and and kind of just branded into you from a young age, um, and so that that fire you kept that fire stoked and that that kept kind of that kept driving you through all of this. Um, what was it like um, d at any point here? Were you ever feeling? And by the way, what division is is Miami? Division one. So my, you my my. My junior and senior, we finished number uh, 15 in the country. And my senior, we finished number 10 in the country. You know, so we, we played Florida, Georgia, Purdue, Kentucky, South Carolina. So this know, is, yeah, this is. We played and we won. This is the big leagues, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 I mean, not, not as big as the Ohio States and the Michigans, but. But you're right there. Vision, just, just not, not as many people. And so, and so you, so you, you excelled through all of this. Um, did you ever is did you ever have in your mind like ah this this isn't for me I'm too small I'm too this I'm too I'm too um, whatever or are you just like no I, I'm gonna do this like I, I don't care what it takes I'm just not gonna stop like what was your mentality I I, I loved the competition I mm. loved competing I loved going out there and and I would literally have centers and guards come out on the first play of the game because they by the time I'm a junior senior you know they, everybody knew on the opposite teams who I was because you would scout for it, you know, and, and so like that. And I remember one game we were playing against Florida in the uh, Tangerine Bowl and they come out and they look and the center says to the guard, he says, this is what they're making a big deal about talking about me. Cause it was, but, I mean, they're six foot five on five, 11 and a half, you know? So it's like, you know, and, and by the end of the game, I ended up getting most of our player of the, of the Tangerine Bowl. I had like six sacks. I mean, so I guess, you know, everybody underestimated me, but I just played with such ferocity. I, I uh, you know, the competition, I never, ever quit. I mean, everything I did was 100%. Most people, most pros have never given 100%. Because they've always been physical specimens, whether they're the biggest, the strongest, the fastest. They're giving 80, but their 80 is better than anybody else's 100%. I was giving 100% all the time because when I had to to survive, if I would have coasted at 80, I would have been crushed. And But you can accomplish a lot when you're giving 100% and no one else is. It just takes one time, one play. All of a sudden, you're at the right spot at the right time. And that's what I started seeing you know, in my life, I, I believe you can accomplish anything if you're willing, one, you're willing to pay the price. There's always a price that has to be paid. And you don't listen to the naysayers because everyone told me I could never do it. I would never, never make it. Like that. And many people start believing what other people say about them instead of really feeling from the inside and say, wait a second, I can do this and I'm going to do it. I like it. I love it. I love it. I loved competing. I loved winning. 
I love the fact of, for me, it was me against that center or me against that center and a guard. Who's going to win that individual battle on every play? Who's going to win that individual battle? Not forget the whole game, but if I win most of the time those individual battles, by the end of the game, I'm going to do pretty good. And the team's going to do pretty good. That's, 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 you know, let me pause there for a second because you said something really profound. Like, it's not about the game, it's about that moment, that one play. That, that they're getting ready to hike the ball, and that's, that, is your, that is your battle right then and there, and that's, that's all exactly you have right. to focus on. And then and, they stack and up. And if everybody does that, and the great teams, you know, that I, when I play with the Pittsburgh Steelers and the great teams like that, that's what they instill. You do your job. You do your job, and if everybody else does their job, we're going to do really okay. And, and it's like that. And, and my job on certain things, my job was to make sure that um, I, I, uh, I, I jammed the, the quarterback back, I mean, the, the center back, and I was able to get, get in there. Other times I was to shoot the gap. Whatever the thing was, that was my job for that play. And everybody else had to do their job. Otherwise, if they didn't, then there was a big hole. And that's. So why don't, what do, do you think, I'm just I want to get into the NFL stuff in a second, but like, why do you think, what set you apart? Like, we, I mean, because we don't see, 195 pound people in, in, in those positions at, on, on average, like what, what really like, I mean, do you, uh, it's just, you're kind of an anomaly. You're like that. You're like the real life Rudy here. Well, I, I, yeah, I'm my, my Rudy story is one that I didn't just play for one play at the last play of the game. I ended up yeah, you did it. You really three right. years and, you know, making it to the, 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 the I, I would say that the biggest thing that, that I could see is that when I got this, one is I had to have a scholarship. Somehow I had to get a scholarship. I was willing to do whatever it takes. I always look back and I ask the question, what if I would never wrote the letters to the colleges? If I never wrote the letters to the colleges, I wouldn't have been, uh, Miami wouldn't have called me up. And then when I found out I had to work in the sewers, there's a lot of people wouldn't work in the sewers. They would have said like that. But I did what I had to do to be able to get to that next phase. I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't know my life was going to turn out the way that, that it has. God has a, a, a big aspect of that as we get further into the story, but I will just share you this. This was my life, and it's the only time that I felt good. I surely didn't feel good about the way I was raised. I didn't feel good about, uh, about a lot of things, but I felt good when I was competing. I felt good when it was I could go out there and be able to, to do something, and recognizing I wasn't going to I wasn't going to be what my mom told me I was going to be. My mom told me I was going to be a loser. I was no good. I was a bum. I'll never amount to anything. You're just like your father. I mean, that's what I heard over and over and over. Right. That was your big drive, wasn't it? What? That what you just said, like, as far as like, I'm not going to, what your mom was saying to you and all that kind of stuff. No, I didn't want that life. I didn't yeah. want that at all. And, 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 uh, but and that's what drove for, you, right? Yeah, for whatever. Yeah, well, what drove me was was that then when I was doing well in sports, and then feeling other people one respect me. Two was the perspective of of you know going out and recognizing and say, yeah, I I'm good, I'm good. I, I'm I, I, but I worked my butt off, you know, to to get good. I did lots of things a lot of people wouldn't do because right. that's the only way I knew how to do it. Did you just curious, like what, what happened as you started experiencing success at the college level? What happened with your parents? Did that, did they start kind of warming up to you or did they try to say like, Oh, this isn't going to last. Or what, what, what was that like? No, you know, when I, when I got into the quote, the high school level and, and excelled and then even more so in the college level, they'd come down to the games and, okay, okay. you know, they were, you know, by this time I, they weren't, I, I became the family hero if, sure, in, in so sure. many words. Yep. And yep. so, the, but I lived, when I left for college, I spent one night back in my home after I left for college for my whole, entire life. I never went back home. Um, uh, you know, like during the summer times I'd work, um, but I'd, I'd stay with some guys. Like I wouldn't go back to home home and, and stay. Because right. it wasn't home to me. It, yeah. it, it was it was a miserable existence, and um, I was the oldest. Um, and so, uh, you know, for for me, I just really, really uh, went out and said, "I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this." By that, uh, at that time, I'm going to do this on my own. I'm going to work hard. I'm going to become a legend. 
and sort of in my mind. And at Miami, I am a legend. In Miami, you know, I'm one of the few first-team All-Americans that has ever come from Miami. I'm one of the few. Uh, ben Roethlisberger is a Miami guy. Um, and, uh, you know, so um, there's some other ones that are out there. But because of being a walk-on and doing what I did, I, I, I go back and speak to Miami University all the time and their teams and things like that. So. And so uh, I wonder, you know, maybe you can, I wonder as you started to experience success, I wonder if your, uh, if your siblings started getting like, why can't you be like Brad? Look at Brad. Look at, he's doing this. Why aren't you, you know, you're, I wonder what that I was know, like. I, I, I always used to get, why don't you be like your younger brother or something like that? See, mm. my younger brother was, he was the accepted one because he was born within marriage. Mm. I was born outside of marriage, even though he's 11 months younger than me. My, my brother is 11 months younger than me. And he could do no wrong and I could do no right. And it was really, really obvious. People would see it and they go, man, you're beating up on him. And, you know, Rick, my brother, um, you know, is um, just got a, got a free ride. But, you know, I, I don't blame my mom and dad. I, I, as crazy as this is, my mom and dad are, were damaged goods. They were damaged goods from the way they were brought up and things like that. And so, you know, I, I wouldn't know what to do to handle a kid at 16 and 17 and 18 years of old, like my mom did. I mean, uh, you know, there, a lot of people say, well, you know, I've forgiven my mom and dad a long, long time ago. They did the best they could under their circumstances. They were wrong. The way they did it were wrong, but they did the best they could under where, how they were raised. Yeah, absolutely, man. That's a huge lesson. And I think in, in some ways they, they gave you a gift in some ways. Um, that you, you would come out, you would, you would be a different person. And so, and I, and I love what you said, like people just do the best they can based on what they perceive available to them and their upbringing. And I, like you said, you know, it's generations yeah. maybe even of, of things a certain way. I got, I got a bittersweet story that I can tell you real quick on like this about my mom. I never remember being held or cuddled or, 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 or loved by my, by my mom. And I, my dad was in a bowling lead, and I'm probably 12 or 13, no, probably about 10 or 11. We're running around having fun at the bowling alley, the, the kids and stuff like that, and, you know, doing what you do on a Friday night. My dad had drink a little bit too much. Somebody in a wrestling, we were wrestling, having fun, ripped my shirt. My mom lost it on the way home. She just freaked out when she saw a, a, what, that this, my sweater was ripped. My dad finally get home and she just starts egging my dad, egging my dad. You got to do something about this thing. And got my dad in such a rage that I got beat so bad that um, it went on for about 15, 20 minutes. My mom kept saying more and more and more and he just sort of lost it. And I'm bleeding. I'm bleeding all over my back and on the side and stuff like that. And the bittersweet part is, is that when it was all over, and I was just sort of in shock, dad left home. He was crying. He left home. My mom sat down and took some cloths and had me lay on my stomach, and she took these cloths and, 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 and wiped me off and stuff like that. And it was the most gentle thing that she'd ever done for me. And I look back, her saying, you know, saying she was sorry, saying she was doing all that. Yeah. And that's how, that's the only time I can remember doing it. This is after the meeting that she won. I, I can't believe I'm crying about this. But, it's all right. But yeah. um, th that's how, how bad, that's my, that's my fond thought of my mom of being um, the way that she should have been. All right. So. So listen, I got a question for you because some of the stuff that you're talking about kind of resonates with me. You know, I came out a little bit less of a rougher, you know, um, growing up as you did. But a lot of times what I get asked quite a bit is, you know, there's two different paths that people can take, you know, and we sometimes share a story at the three day where there is like, you know, two people, twins that came out of the same household and one went, became very successful. The other one became an alcoholic and all that kind of stuff. And both had the same answer and basically said, well, I came out of this environment. What else am I supposed to do, right? How else am I supposed to be better, right? So when, I don't know if you ever had anybody ask you that question, like, how is it that you turn out, 
you know, because you could have very well just accepted that environment, that way of life, right? And just became, became the same man moving forward, right? Maybe, you know, took the same exact path, you know, work in the mines or whatever it might be, right? You chose to be do a different path, right? Will you tell people who basically would ask, like, you know, how is it that you chose that path, right? Uh, I think your environment, um, to give you an example of stuff I get in my family, I've got two brothers and a sister, sister that's 18 years younger than me, and my two brothers, um, they've been divorced two, three times. They've spent time in jail for passing bad checks. They've been involved in alcohol and drugs and stuff like that. I mean, re really bad stuff. I've, I've had to help them get out of jail, I've, stuff like that. My kids see the difference between their cousins. Right. Came from the same family. We had the same stuff. I had a tougher route to go than the other ones, but we're still all in the same family. I don't know as much as the reason why, except that I wasn't willing to go along with the crowd. I, I never drank at all until college. I never had a beer. All my friends were drinking. They were like that. I, I, my dad's an alcoholic. I, I, mm -hmm. I had no positive thinking about that. Right. I just wasn't going to be a follower of, you know, what everybody else was doing. And whereas my, my brothers, they get to college and, you know, in college you're smoking dope and you're drinking and you're doing stuff like that. And I did a little bit of that. Um, but I, it was a passing thing. It, it didn't pass for my brothers. And so I got, they still, they're still doing it. Right. You know, to this day, it's affected their families. Right. Exactly. I totally get it because, you know, I've seen this happen in, you know, my own life kind of thing. But so my question to you is, do you believe that as a person, you have a choice or you just become the product of the environment and just do whatever it is? Or do you literally have a choice as a person to uh, which way you want to go? God has given us choice, free will. And so we, we all have a choice. The problem is that nobody, a lot of people never sit down and think about the choices that they're making. They go with the flow. They go with what their friends are doing. It depends on, you know, there's a, there is a saying, if you, if, if you're choosing bad company, you're going to turn out bad, you know, to be with. And so absolutely there's a choice. Nobody is left to say, well, this is because my parents were this way or that way. It helps. My wife came from, we've been married 43 years. My wife came from a perfect family environment. There was no cussing, no cursing, total love. You know, they, they, they would never even think about lying. I mean, they just had the totally opposite of me. And I saw it in action. And I said, that's what I want my life to be like. That's what I want my, how my kids to love and respect me. Seeing it from her. And this is why we were dating. Just me seeing the difference. Because it was totally different than, than my upbringing, obviously. Yeah. So yeah, absolutely. Free choice, free will. You can choose to study. You can choose not to. You can choose to cheat. You can choose to, you know, like the world system is corrupted in such a way that it almost, if you're the, if you're weird by trying to becoming more than what you, your environment says you are, you're, you're sort of weird, but that's, I'm, I guess I'm weird. And sometimes that's a really good thing. Well, and so, and so, you know, there's a, as you're, as you're speaking, Brad, like I, I, you know, we all have free will, like you've said, as well as um, there is a cause and effect to, to our actions, our decisions, our choices, our behaviors. And so you've, you made different choices and you had different dr drivers. And so um, take us, so, so here you are, you're getting ready to, to graduate college. Did you have people scouting you for the NFL or was this, what was that like? Like, and you knew you still wanted to continue to play football. Yeah, well, um, I was scouted in the sense that my, my a, a real a quick thing, I, I made the All-American teams in 1973, 74, um, first team, second team, depending upon which one it was. On one of the ones I made All-American, they put me as a linebacker because they said, you are too small to be an All-American on our All-American team at 197 pounds. So they put me as an outside linebacker. I had the best stats. I had everything like that. I never played a down of linebacker in college, and they put me as a linebacker. The other teams, they had me as a middle guard. Um, but I would 
I wanted to play in the NFL. I knew that I wouldn't go in the upper rounds because they couldn't forecast me as a linebacker because I never played linebacker and I played middle guard and I was way too small in pros to play middle guard. And so, um, but I figured, and what scouts were telling me is they thought I'd go in the middle to late rounds. You know, I, I'd get, a, I'd get, and that's when they had 17 rounds. Mm. There was, so there was 442 football players. That year, they drafted two basketball players that never played one down of college football, and I didn't get drafted. They basically, um, they uh, got through the draft after the 17 rounds. I got calls from a couple of coaches, from uh, Chuck Knoll and from uh, Paul Brown of the Bengals. They said, Brad, you should have been drafted, but, you know, you weren't. Uh, we'd like for you to try out as a free agent, a walk-on. Back then, so that was like another walk-on. And um, I chose the Cincinnati Bengals because I thought they had bigger holes. And, and, and long and short of it is I grew up, uh, or Oxford University is about, uh, Oxford, Ohio, which is Miami University, is about 45 minutes from Cincinnati. So it was something I was aware of. And, and uh, got a $500 signing bonus. If I, um, if I made the team, I made another 1000 And I played at the minimum. That year they had 13 linebackers. I was number 13, and they only keep seven. So the chances of me making it were slim to none because I never, you know, like ah, I ended up making the team. And I made it out of sheer desire. It was by special teams. And every time I got in at linebacker, I always had more tackles than anybody else. I, I just had a knack of making things happen. Even though I was small and undersized, I was quick, and I had no fear. And um, so I made the team. Um, backed up Jim LeClaire um, at that point in time, who was an all pro, became an all pro and, um, and, and had my first year there uh, with, the, with the Bengals and had a great, a great thing. People just were amazed at the things I was able to do. I was one of the premier special teams player in the league back in that, back in that day. Hmm. Do you think that your size actually was an advantage for you? The fact that you were never, smaller? Yeah, it never... I never thought it was like that. See, I, I wrestled in high school and a couple of years in college, and I knew how to use leverage. I knew how to be able to, uh, you know, get underneath someone's pads and being able to, you know, disengage and things like that. So it really helped me, and I was very quick to play against these bigger guys, and so I, I used my quickness to, to, to the advantage, right. you know, of that. So I, I never thought it was a disadvantage, but, you know, so you made the most of the of the hand you were dealt yeah. physically, like, yeah. and you learned Absolutely. how to, yeah. Um, and everybody has a different hand. So, so okay, so here you are, uh, and then you you actually you have you have history with three different NFL teams, though. So play that out for us. Yeah, my first year with the Bengals with Paul Brown. That was Paul Brown's last year as head coach. He ended up um, retiring, becoming the general manager, and then brought another guy on that was on his staff. I had a meeting with him before uh, the, the summer ball. And I went to him and said, coach, I, I, I just want to know, am I in your guys' plans for linebacker? And they go, Brad, you're our number one guy for special teams. We love you. You're going to get some playing time, but no, you're not going to, you're not a factor as far as being the starting, you know, middle linebacker. And uh, I groused about that. And I, I said, coach, but look at the stats. My numbers are, and he said, Brad, we don't know how you do it says it's amazing but one we don't think you could last the whole season and two is we want our middle linebackers to be six foot four and 240 pounds not five eleven and a half and 210 pounds by that time so um i got traded i got traded to chicago bears and when i went there um i went there with a chip on my shoulder i could not believe i got traded and uh so I ended up going there, and after about five or six weeks of summer ball, same thing happened. I'm excelling on special teams. I'm backup linebacker, but I'm, I got the best stats. Of everybody on that team for tackles, I had more sacks, more interceptions, more fumbles caused. They still had me as a backup. Went, went to the coach, head coach at that time, in my, my arrogance, and I said, Coach, What's going on? Why, why aren't I getting a fair shot? They told me the same thing. Brad, you're amazing. We love what you do, but you're not going to, you know, this is where Dick Buckus played. Dick Buckus. You know, we want somebody that's six foot four is going to 245 pounds each glass, and that's what we're going to have for our middle linebacker. And on my way out of that meeting, I told the coach, Coach, 
either play me or trade me. In my arrogance, the next day they waived me, cut me, went through waivers, and when that happened, my whole life as I knew it then ended. It was like immediate. Who's going to like Brad Kuzma without playing football? Who, what, what's Brad Kuzma? Even though I still had the same amount of money in my bank account, I was still, you know, I was still an ath a pro athlete. I, I knew I'd get picked up by somebody because everybody's always looking for special teams players once the season gets started and, and, and like that. And I went into this deep depression. And I, I was always a reader. I always read and I was reading a number of books. And the things I noticed in the books I was reading, they all referred to a higher power. I was raised Catholic, but I basically made a deal with God a long time ago. I said, God, you do your thing. I'll do my thing. You know, you're doing well. And, you know, like I, had, I hadn't been to church in years, hadn't had any, you know, it was me. It was me. I was the, 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 the superstar. And that got me, and as I was going through all these books, this common thread, they never would say Jesus Christ. A few said God. Most of them was talking about the supreme conscious, you know, subconscious mind, you know, one of those kinds of things. And, you know, um, and, um, and it was through that, that put me on the cycle like this. Now I got, ended up picked up by the New York Giants, um, you know, about four weeks into it. But in the back of my mind, I'm going, what? was the matter that now I'm back on top doing really well it's time for uh the season's over I get asked to speak at a number of different events and one of them was a Amway rally in Charlotte North Carolina everybody loves to hear about the underdog I was brought in there was I don't know 4,000 people there and I gave my story and you know and stuff like that and uh the next day they had a church service um, before people left for home. And so uh, my fiance at that time, Tammy, uh, and I, we, um, I said, well, we'll go to the church. I'd been to church in six years. And we'll, we'll go to this service. And then I figured there'd be about 40 people there. And then we'll head back to Cincinnati because we drove. Six hour, eight hour drive. I walked in there. And there was probably 1,800 people in there at 7 o'clock in the morning after a convention, you know, a Saturday mm -hmm. night convention. I'm going, what's going on here? There was a guy speaking. I don't know even know what his name, uh, what, what he really said, but there was an altar call. Well, Catholics don't do altar calls. I grabbed Tam's hand, and we walked, went up to the thing, and I didn't realize she had to make her own. I didn't know what I was doing. I was just doing it you know, like that. And I remember walking away from there very dejected because as I walked away, I didn't get any of the goosebumps. I didn't get any of the feel goods. People were laughing and crying and hugging and they were doing all this stuff. And I felt nothing. Drive back to Cincinnati. Nobody knows what I, I didn't think I'd done anything. Later that week, I'm in a, I'm in a mall. I go uh, to a Christian books. I, I walk by a Christian bookstore, decided to walk in, walk out with a Bible. I, I'd never bought a Bible in my life. Couldn't understand it. It was the original King James, you know, Two days later, I'm back in the mall. I bought another Bible. And this was a much easier one. It was like a living word. And I would get up. It was during the off season. And I'd get up at 7, 8 o'clock in the morning. The next thing I'd know, it'd be 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And I was just mesmerized reading. It was like I had these huge holes in my heart that was being filled by re just reading. Nobody told me I needed to do it. I No one says you got to be able to do it. And that's the what started happening, you know, in my life. This was in January 1977. And um, three months later, I get married to Tammy. We've been married now 43 years, 70 like this. And um, that's what saved my marriage. Most athletes, when they get out of football or get out of a sport, they really struggle. They struggle with their self-esteem. They struggle with like that, puts a lot of pressure on it. Because of going through that, God started changing me. And two ways he changed me immediately was I had a foul mouth. Every other word was JC this and F you this and, and GD this. You know, like that. And I noticed that when someone would take the Lord's name in vain, I'd cringe. It would be almost like taking fingernails on a chalkboard. I didn't understand. I, I, you know, I didn't ask like that. And the next thing was is that I noticed is that I had this huge temper. One of the reasons I played so well is I played with this huge temper uh, uh, going on, just, just pain, pain with all that pain. 
and somebody stole, broke into my car, broke the window, and stole eight my eight track tapes. I had a box of eight track tapes. That's how old this was. And I remember sitting on the side of my car. Normally, I'd been going berserk, and I said, "Well, I hope whoever stole them enjoys them, because they were packed with all Christian tapes." <laughs> and I go, "What is the matter with you, Brad?" I mean, there's, it was like, "Is this is this a zombie I'm talking to here?" I mean, I I literally and and to this day, my kids have never heard me swear. I, I don't swear. I, it's not like somebody says, you got to snap, snap, swear. I, it was just immediately taken away. I do not swear. My swear word is shoot. If somebody goes, I'm shoot, you know, like that. So I don't know. That's a God thing. That wasn't a Brad thing. There's been lots of other things I wish he would change a lot faster than what he did, but, but I'm still working on some of those. But that's like that. And, and I can look back to see my family and everything was like this. My, my four kids are doing wonderful. They've married great spouses. They got great kids. Um, you know, we are just so blessed in so many ways. But I look back to this. What if I never would have been released from football? What if I would have went on in the NFL and become a superstar? I had the ability to do that. I did it in college. And if they would have let me play, I, I know that I could have done that. I, I just – that. Like, but it didn't happen that way. And I'm convinced that if I would have went on to become a superstar, I might never have become a Christian mm. because it took the difficult times of being back on like that. And, and, and like that, and through all of that, that was a light, that, that was a generational change for my family and me for generations that are affected because of that. If I didn't get released from football, would I have become a Christian? I, I who knows, but I would tell you, it took the pain of that to get me to the point where I recognized I needed, I needed a lot more than what I was bringing to the table myself. Man, that, that is an incredible story. And so with this, did, did your conversion, um, was it, were you still play? you were still playing? Did you mention you're still playing? I played with the Steelers. I played with the, I played with the New York Giants. Did you? I, I, I was always on the bubble. Okay. Because of my size. So every year I'd always be one of the last ones to make the team because they're going to say, well, we drafted this guy here to take his spot, but he's better on the field. And, you know, so I ended up making, but I knew it wasn't going to last long. And so did you, I'm wondering, and so I'm wondering like as, as, as you can, as this conversion and, and did, and this, this, this rage, this pain starts to subside in you, um, was this all coming to, did, did you start thinking differently? You're like, Hey, you know what, maybe, Maybe I've had enough here. Maybe maybe God has a different mission for me. Maybe uh, I'm supposed to be in somewhere a different place. Or like, how did that how did that all kind of play out for you? Like, I'm actually even wondering, did you look at the NFL differently? Because now you, I mean, did you feel like you still had to prove yourself? Was this had you reached that stage yet, or had you, um, you know, recognize like, hey, you know, I'm 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 loved. I'm enough just the way I am. And and yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say I was that mature yet to yeah. do that. I would okay. say that I loved the competition. I still loved it after being, you know, as a Christian, I loved it. I loved going out. I just found that I had more opportunities to share my story right. um, as because of church groups, things like that. I mean, I ended up, um, you know, there was a, a ministry within the NFL called Pro Athletes Outreach, and it would be Christian players that would go at the end of the season and then they would bring guys together and show, tell them how to share their testimony and how to be able to, because we have a platform. And because we have a platform, we could go out there and say things. And so I got very involved in that and, um, and, and being able to go out and give them a testimony, do a lot of, did a lot of work with churches and youth groups and things like that, because everybody loves to hear about one, somebody that played the NFL and or the underdog, my story as a Christian, I wasn't raised as a Christian. I didn't become a Christian until I was 24 years of age. And um, so, so I, I can just say this is that it was part of God's plan that I would went through that. And uh, there was lots of times as a Christian, I was growing. And at the same time is, is that It doesn't all change immediately. There's a process, at least there was for me. And so um, I, I, I really, um, I, you know, I studied, I was an elder for a number of years. I, you know, so I got, and I really believe that God, God loved me. But God's got to love everybody. I just wasn't so convinced he liked me all that much. 
coming back from my upbringing with my mom. And this was after being 10, 15 years as a Christian. I knew I'd go to heaven. I knew like that. But this idea of being loved just because God is our father, that we are accepted, we are loved, we are forgiven. I said the words. I just didn't. I sense that sometimes I'm going to God and I'm a nuisance. Uh, God's too busy. He's got plenty of other things to worry about than, than what Brad's doing. You know, like that. Until I went through, I don't until I went through the bankruptcy. I, I didn't even tell you about the real estate stuff. I sort of skipped over that. Yeah. Well, you know, so Brad, I got to tell you, um, listen, and this is, this is exactly why I knew I had to get you in the podcast because you have such an incredible story. And, the, and, and Peter, I'm curious if you have some different takeaways here, but some of the things that just so resonated with me as you're talking is like, number one, like you are someone who has, you've shown up, you've, you, you did the work you you put in the you put in the, the effort you you took the chances you um you know you, you made things happen you you didn't just wait for things like what like you mentioned earlier like what if you hadn't sent those letters to the to, to i mean and but this is your whole life has been a series of what if i what if i didn't but you did and so you constantly made things happen there um and so you you did the work, but you also you also did something with that, and and so so many people just wait for things to happen or watch things happen, and that wasn't you. But the the, the coolest thing like that that and and that this is all super relevant and and awesome, but but also what really struck me is like what you kind of finished with is that like all of this stuff happened really for a reason, and there was a there was a direction and a design to it that you had no clue about until until much much later much much later and your perspective has shifted and so i'd have that same encouragement to anybody else that's going through something in their life where they don't understand it like you know we talk in life and air a lot about your mess being your message and you have been set up to to go through i mean because we can even say like you know we could you could say that even and i mentioned earlier that some of the things that you experienced could have even been a gift and it was a gift that was designed perfectly for you to get you to do the things that you did so that you now have a platform like you mentioned to share to impact people to to change lives and to and to and to shine to to other people that are that are going through something or 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 uh or have their own questions and so that's that's something really really special that i i want to thank you for sharing well, listen man i i really want to thank you for being on, on life in our show if people want to learn more about you or find you how do they do that are you on social media or or do you have a website or anything yeah i, I linkedin you know uh okay. brad Cousin, you know linkedin uh at uh, brad Cousin. I, I i'm in the process of writing a book right now um and uh so that's not and, and a lot of people i've done a lot of different speaking and they've encouraged me to get more and more involved in that sort of one one of the things that, that I've done, and of course we got the COVID, so everything has sort of come down to a grinding halt about speaking and things. But well, and maybe I love being I love being a coach and a mentor and doing things like that because I do believe that I can, my story can help people, yeah. and uh, and and I want to be I I want to be wherever God wants me to be. And and the right person will hear this, and if you're, like you said, you know, then that that'll be an impact in their lives that you had a chance yeah. to make, and who knows what it leads to. Brad, thank you so much for being on Life in Our Show. I enjoyed it, guys. I appreciate you uh, reaching out, and thanks for your uh, your support. Wow, man, that was awesome. I uh, you know, I, I've had a chance to talk to Brad uh, a few times. Um, prior to this this interview, and I got to tell you, the guy the guy is just he has a really cool story. You know, he like I mentioned in the in the interview, like he he just he makes things happen, right? He doesn't take no for an answer. Here's a guy he you know he he's working in the sewers. He's he's writing letter to college coach letters to college coaches. He's he's like doing he just did, did what it took. He did what it took to get to where he wanted to go. He just didn't take no for an answer. Yeah, it was an incredible story to hear. And one of the things that, I mean, you ask at the end of the show about the takeaways. And then, so one of the biggest takeaways that I had of it, first and foremost, I think he needs to call up Detroit Lions because I think they would even take him right now because they need him, you know what I mean? <laughs> so the, he would literally probably make a huge difference in, in the team, right? He's right like now. 67, he would still like kick butt, yeah, right? He, because listen, I hear the takeaways from that because the reason I'm joking about this, but there's an important reason why I say this is this. This guy has a determination, drive, right? And I think the, one of the reasons why he was so successful because he had that drive. He had to prove his whole life. He had to prove something to somebody, to himself or whatever it might be. And 
I believe that deep down inside, he was doing this for a much bigger reason than just him. Because if you saw, you know, if you listen at the end of the episode, he talks about the kids, right? His kids, his own family and what they've been able to do. And as we are, you know, talking with him, I talked to him offline a little bit too. And he said, you know, for the rest of my life, you know, I want to make a difference. You know, I want to make uh, some kind of a, you know, finish strong in my life and all that kind of stuff. So he has yeah. this biggest drive, right? He has a big must, right? It wasn't like I should do this. I should tackle better. I should do this, right? He took his size, he used it as a leverage, he said, you know, and all those kinds of things. So he looked for like, how can I do what I have with what I have to make a huge difference? Yeah. Rock yeah. it out. How can, that how, was a huge point. Yeah. How can, how can I use the gifts I've been given and leverage those in a way that are, that, that give me what I want. And, you know, this is relevant for everyone listening. Like, you know, everyone here has different gifts. We all have different physical gifts, different mental, intellectual, emotional, uh, all of these, all these different gifts are, are different. And so we all have to do, and I think, you know, we kind of, in some regards, I think we have a responsibility to do something powerful with all the gifts we've been given and every, and, um, Instead of using those things as, as excuses, like why you can't do something, here's a guy who, uh, you know, really shouldn't have made it as far as he did based on just his size alone, but he made up for it in, in tenacity and in, in, um, just, 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 just pure drive, like you said, Peter. Um, and so we all have this ability, like take, take what you have and do something with it. And I love also, you know, um, that he, yeah, he wants something better for his for his life, but in a way that impacts other people. And he's been able to change his family tree really with his, with his choices, his, yeah, that's right. You mentioned that. And, um, and so, so we all have this ability. We all have this, um, this, this chance to make a decision that will, will move you in the direction that you want to go. And now he's talking, you know, he's, he's changed his family, but he wants to impact other people. And we didn't get a whole lot into that. He's met, I, when I talked to him offline about the book, he mentioned like, Hey, you know, I just, I, I want to finish strong. Like, like you said, he's like, I want to, uh, to impact people with my story. And like, it would be kind of a shame to, 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 to not let that do that, to, to, to not have that right. ability, um, or that opportunity. And so he's doing that. And so like, yeah, like I said, like you said, he's, he's kind of, he's kind of stepping that up to the next level. Yeah. And that's such an amazing story to hear. I mean, one of the other things that I heard is yeah, I don't believe he ever listened to the naysayers. You know, yeah. there's a lot of people that try to take him down the coaches, you know, mom, dad, siblings, you know, other people in his life is probably growing up, the guys in the sewer and all that kind of stuff and just kept going. He had his yeah. goal, right? And he just kept driving and driving and driving and driving. Didn't take no for an answer. Awesome exactly. interview, everyone. Uh, hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. Uh, if you could find the time, we'd absolutely love for you to leave us in a review. Uh, wherever you are listening to this podcast, uh, it really helps other people quite a bit discover us and and benefit from what we share as well. Uh, also, if you would like to be part of our community, go over and download the Life in Air app. It is completely free, and this is where a lot of great discussions around Life in Air, anything related to having a better life or business, will be discussed. And you can join those conversations. And until next time, thank you for tuning in. We value your time and we value you as a, uh, as a part of the life in our community. We will see you next time. Everyone take care.